I'm excited to introduce our speaker tonight in the person of Brother Joe Caesar. He's the minister of the Old Queen Church of Christ in Lufkin, Texas. And Brother Caesar is going to come and teach us on the subject, on the topic, the truth about baptism. We'll let Brother Caesar come in his own way at this time. What like I would like to welcome everybody. First of all, thank you, Brother Brooks and Brother Flunder, for having me on this call. I want to welcome all the guests, especially those who are visiting and not members of the Church of Christ. Uh, we welcome you. You are our VIP. So thank you for joining us. I'd like to address the subject of truth about baptism. I, I want to introduce this topic by sharing with you um, Assuming that you're not very familiar with the scripture, I always assume that I'm starting from ground zero. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Bible as a whole and how interconnected the Bible is, uh, this lesson will be for you so you can see the interconnectedness of the Bible. The Bible operates off of patterns, and those patterns are called types or typology. For example, Jesus is described, or Moses is described as a type of Christ or a type of Jesus. The reason why is because he led the children of Israel out of bondage. He led them through the wilderness, and he brought them to the promised land. Like Moses, Jesus brings us out of the bondage of sin. He leads us through a wilderness wandering, and he gets us to the promised land, to heaven, if we follow his leadership. So therefore, we call that a type or a pattern. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 13, I'd like to share with you a pattern that we find in the Old Testament that we can also relate with the New. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 13. There the Hebrew writer says, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling to sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The Hebrew writer, what he's saying is that if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, if, if those uh, methods of purifying those men and women in the Old Testament who sinned against God, if they were sanctifying and purifying the flesh, is not the sacrifice of Christ greater than the sacrifice of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer? In Numbers chapter 19, we find out more about this heifer. In the Old Testament, there was an ordinance called the Ordinance of the Red Heifer. That's found in Numbers chapter 19, starting at verse number 1. There Moses writes, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. Notice how the Bible talks about this heifer, that it, could, it had to be flawless, no spot. There was no blemish, just like a sacrifice should be. And you shall give her unto Eleazar the priest, that he may bring her forth without the camp. I'm reading from the King James Version, but that word without the camp means he was going to bring this heifer to the outside of the city. It was a spotless heifer, a heifer that was without blemish, and this heifer was described as a red heifer. And the Bible says, and one shall slay her before his face. And Eleazar the priest shall take of her the blood with his finger and sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. So just step back for one second and, and take a look at what's going on. You've got a spotless sacrifice without blemish. And the sacrifice is brought to the outside of the city and the sacrifice is slain. And then the blood was going to be used to, to um, uh, clear up or take away um, or to be poured on the tabernacle of the congregation. Just like our Lord and Savior was a, a lamb that was perfect. Jesus had no flaw. He lived his entire life without sin. 
we crucified Jesus and brought him out of the city to crucify him. And the Bible says in John chapter 19 and verse number one that Pontius Pilate scourged Jesus. Blood was shed on his back. They placed a crown of thorns on his head. So therefore, there was blood all over Jesus. He was a bloody mess. And the Bible says that Jesus was brought. He had to carry his cross out of the city onto Mount Golgotha. That is the exact type of sacrifice that was made in the Old Testament, except this sacrifice was better. It was more perfect. And the Bible says in verse number five, and one shall burn the heifer in his sight, her skin and her flesh and her blood and her dung, he shall, shall he burn. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. So when you burn the heifer with the blood and with the, with, with the, the wood, with the skin, What's going to result, just as if you were to cremate a human being, what's going to result is a pile of ashes. And the Bible says in verse number seven, then the priest shall wash his clothes and he shall bathe his flesh in the water. And afterwards he shall come into the camp and the priest shall be unclean until the even. And he that burneth her shall wash his clothes in water and bathe his flesh in water and shall be unclean until the even. And a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer. Now, remember what the ashes represent. That was blood included in the ashes. And the Bible says, and lay them up without the camp in a clean place, and it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. They took the ashes of the heifer and they put it in a large container of water. And then when people need to be purified, the children of Israel needed to be purified, they would go and bathe in the water that was intermingled with the ashes from the unblemished heifer, which included the blood. That, my friends, is exactly what baptism is about. That is the truth of the baptism, that baptism is that which consists of water, and we come in direct contact with the blood of Jesus by faith. And that blood will cleanse us of our impurity. And our impurity is sin, just as it was in the Old Testament. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, and verse number 5. And I want everybody to read that, so I will repeat the scripture. Revelation, chapter 1, and verse number 5. The Bible says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Notice that we're being washed of our sins in his own blood. So not only, see, in the Old Testament, there was a priest that had to take a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice, and create the ashes to wash the children of Israel from their sins. In the New Testament, our high priest, our, the great priest, is Jesus Christ. So not only is he the one offering the sacrifice, but he is the sacrifice itself at the same time. And the Bible says that he loved us and washed us from his own blood. And you may be asking, well, uh, Joe Caesar, where is this blood of Jesus? The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 22 and verse number 16, this is Paul. Paul is praying. And Paul is wanting to have a relationship with God. Paul has, has, has his, vision ver, vision, his vision blurred by God. Remember, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he put scales on his eyes so that he could not see clearly. And in this case, he's, he's with uh, Philip, who's trying to share with him the gospel, and Philip finds Paul praying. And he asked Paul in verse number 16 of Acts chapter 22, and now why tarriest thou, arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friends, if you're going to be free from your sin, you must be baptized in water. In the Old Testament, there was water that was mixed with ashes. In the New Testament, yes, we do not have the literal blood of Jesus, but by faith that water is the blood of Jesus. And when we get in touch with the water, we get in touch with the blood, which has that healing power, 
to purify us of our sins. I can only imagine during this time with COVID-19, I can only imagine if someone found a cure. Can you imagine if the cure for COVID-19 was baptism? How many people would climb, scratch, and claw? How many people would get in car accidents? How much money would the wealthy who have COVID-19 pay to get into the water? And do you not know that right now salvation is free when, as far as money? You can actually, by faith, get in the grave of baptism and wash away your sins today and be whole in the sight of God? So that's one type. We've got the Old Testament reference regarding the, the ordinance of the red heifer. And I want to move on to the second type, and this is regarding uh, how we are buried with Christ. When we are baptized, we're not being baptized alone. We are being buried with Christ. In the book of 2 Kings, chapter 13, in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 13, and verse number 20. And while you're turning there, I want to give you some background. So you have Elijah, the great prophet Elijah, the one who, who resisted 500 prophets of Baal. Uh, this is the same uh, Elijah that was uh, in the cave uh, hiding from Jezebel. You've got Elijah, and God tells Elijah, you've got to find someone to put your mantle on. You've got to find an understudy that's going to take your place. Your time is coming to an end. Elisha is that understudy, and Elisha became a great prophet himself. And the Bible says in verse number 20 of 2 Kings chapter 13, and Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the, of the year. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, that, behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast a man into the sepulcher. A sepulcher is the grave of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Elisha's bones were so holy that when a dead man came in touch with the bones of Elisha, then he got up, he was resurrected from the dead. Those are some holy bones. So what if it was possible for us to be buried with Jesus Christ, who is the most holy human being that has ever walked the face of the earth, not because he was human, but because he was God himself. In Romans chapter 6 and verse number 1, Romans chapter 6 and verse number 1, we find Paul, he's expressing to us, and explaining to us the power of baptism and the power of us being buried with Christ. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And then here's the question. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? A baptism, that word bat, bat, baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to bury or to submerge. It's not a sprinkle. You are literally being buried with Christ. And the Bible says in verse number four, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. So just like that man, uh, that pattern or that example we have of that dead man who was thrown into the grave of that holy man, that man, the prophet of God, Elisha, and he was resurrected, how much better is the blood of Jesus than the bones of Elisha? So in order for us to meet and be buried with Christ, we must be baptized in water. And this is what the Bible is telling us to do. Watch what the Bible says in verse number five. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Friends, what we all have to ask ourselves, if someone is teaching a doctrine about coming in touch with the blood of Jesus, absent of being buried with him in baptism, then that cannot be true. The truth of baptism is that it is absolutely necessary for you to be, uh, if you want to be in touch or be buried with Christ, you absolutely must be baptized in water 
and any other doctrine is a false doctrine. So that's the second type, and I'd like to share with you the third type. In Genesis chapter 17 and verse number 11, Genesis chapter 17 and verse number 11, and I want to share with you some background on this. This is the most, one of the most uh, prominent uh, doctrines, commandments, and laws in the Jewish faith. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 17 and verse number 11, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And that's between um, um, the Jews, man, and God. In verse number 12, and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man, child in your generations. He that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger. That's, that's someone who became a slave. If you wanted your slave to be um, uh, considered a child, a child of Israel or part of the tribe that is, uh, that is Israelite, then um, he must be circumcised. The Bible says in verse 13, he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child, so now we're dealing with a male who is a child who is born, and the Bible says, so this, this child has to be uh, uh, less than eight days old. The Bible says whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised. So the law stated that you must be circumcised by the eighth day. And if you were not circumcised, the Bible says that soul shall be cut off from his people. So for seven days, he can be an Israelite. But on the eighth day, if he is not circumcised, then his soul shall be cut off from his people because he has broken my covenant. And that, that doctrine, that law was applicable not just to the child, but also to the adult who failed that child by not circumcising him. How do I know that? If you turn to the next book over and go to Exodus chapter 4, we have an excellent example of someone who almost got himself in trouble by not following that law. And to prove that God is not a respecter of persons, one of the most famous characters in the Old Testament, the great man Moses, in Exodus chapter 4 and verse number 24, Moses got busy and is like, just like most of us, we get busy and we forget about God sometimes. Uh, we forget to worship God sometimes. We forget to pray to God. We forget to treat people right. We forget to be courteous. We forget to be loving to our family, friends, in some cases our wives and husbands. Life happens. And for Moses, Moses was a man just like, just like any one of us. And his, his son was born, and Moses got busy doing what Moses was doing. Moses had a, a weight, the weight of the world, the weight of all of Israel on his shoulders as he was trying to lead his people. And the Bible says in verse number 24, and it came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him, met Moses, and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. Zipporah was not a fan of circumcision, but she knew she must do it in order to save her child and to save her husband. So then in verse number 26, so he, and that he is, in, is referencing God, so he let him go. Then she said, a bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. So in this case, in the Old Testament, the circumcision, and what I would like to share with you today is that the circumcision is a type of baptism because the circumcision was almost, the, it was the, the pathway into becoming an Israelite. Every male was circumcised. It was a rite of passage. It made you part of the Israelite family. And there was no such thing as an Israelite male who was uncircumcised. If you were uncircumcised, you were considered unclean. Even the Gentiles, who the law did not apply, they were considered unclean regarding the law. So what does that have to do with us? Baptism is the new circumcision. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse number 13, this is Paul writing, and Paul is, is trying to get the church to understand that you're not in this alone. Paul is trying to get the church 
to understand that when we operate as a body, when we operate collectively as the children and the people of God, that we can't forget that we are part of a, of a whole. We are a small part. We are members, and all of the members put together equates to one body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 13, the Bible says, and this is Paul writing, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now, the body is the church, and I'll show you that in a second, but the church represents the new Israel, the new people of God. We are God's children, and in order for me to be God's child, the Bible says we are baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles. So God took down that wall, that partition that separated Jew and Gentile by removing the law. Then he says, whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So the Bible lets us know that if you want to be a part of the body of Christ, you must be baptized. Therefore, if you are not baptized, you cannot be part of the body of Christ. If you want to be an Israelite, you must be circumcised. If you are not circumcised, you cannot be an Israelite. In, in the same chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you look at verse number 18, the Bible tells us how they get there. See, no one makes a, their own decision uh, that I'm going to put myself in the body. Now, you make the decision that you want to be, but the decision to put you in the body is not yours to make. That's why we don't join the church. We are added to the church, the Bible says in verse number 18. But now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it had pleased him. So when we obey by, by being baptized, the Bible says that God will put us into the body as it pleases him. So in order for me to be pleasing to God, I've got to obey the gospel by faith. And that faith would lead me to baptism. Hebrews, you know, and stay in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I just want to quote this one scripture. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6 says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if, if verse number 18 is true, and we know that it is, then therefore, if it pleases God to put me in a body, then what I have done, going back to verse number 13, being baptized, must be pleasing to God. So therefore, if anyone is saying you don't have to be baptized, then they're saying you can be pleasing to God without doing what he told you to do, and we know that that is not true. In verse number uh, 28, this is where I wanted to get to, uh, verse number 28. Uh, the Bible says, and God has set some in the church. Notice how in verse number 18, God set members, every one of them, in the body. In verse number 28, God set some in the church. Now, God doesn't put people in two different places because that would violate what we understood in verse number 13. For by one spirit are we baptized into one body. So if God adds to the body and the body is the church, then verse number 27 makes a lot more sense. Now, ye are the body of Christ, which also is church. Now, ye are the church of Christ and members in particular. Well, how in the world did I become a member of the church of Christ? I had to be baptized. How in the world did I become an Israelite? Even if I wanted to be a proselyte, if I was a Gentile and I wanted to become an Israelite, how would I do that? I would do that by being circumcised and then becoming obedient to the law. I want to share a verse before we move on. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, because it tells us the process. This is Jesus explaining to his apostles what they must do as they go out into the world and by what authority they are to do it in. In Matthew chapter 28, the Bible says in verse number 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end. Jesus told his apostles, go and teach baptism. Baptize them. Why? Because that's adding them to the family. It's adding them to the church. Baptize them. And then once you baptize them, teach them. Just like a proselyte, once you are circumcised, you are to be taught. The last thing I want to talk about today is what, it, now that we have this information, what am I supposed to do with it? And I want to give you four questions that I, I recommend that 
you ought to ask yourself. These are four questions I ask myself. The first question is, have I sinned? Have I sinned? And then for those who are questioning whether or not you've sinned, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 should help with that question. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So have you sinned? Have I sinned? The answer is yes. So then the next question is, what is the consequence of my sin? Because if I sin, that's a violation of God. Either, either I didn't do something that I was supposed to do or I did something that I wasn't supposed to do. Um, that Something happened to where I violated God's will for me. So what's the consequence of that? Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23 says, for the wages or the payment for sin is death. Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that's the consequence. And the Bible says, and I want to go really, really quickly to Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2 and verse number 3. Romans chapter 2 and verse number 3, because when we talk about the wages of sin is death, I want to be clear on what that looks like. What is death? And is that a, and, and if the Bible says that if I sin, I die and everybody has sinned, then why is there anybody alive? Because all people should be dead. The Bible says in, in Romans chapter 2, looking at verse number 3, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? So you do these things. Do you believe that you're going to get out of it? Do you think you're going to get away with it? Then the Bible says, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? God is long suffering. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So what the Bible tells us is that don't think that we're getting away with it. Just because we're walking around and we're alive and it seems like God is blessing us. If we are living and walking in our sins, we are treasuring, we are storing up wrath for the day of judgment. We're making deposits of sin into the sin account, and then there will be a reckoning when Jesus returns. None of us are going to be able to escape that unless we follow his commandments. So then, when does this, when does this come? When does this uh, wrath come? In John chapter 8 and verse number 21, John chapter 8. And verse 21, the Bible says, Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and you shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, you cannot come. When Jesus comes back, if you are dead in your sin, that's when the bank account is brought to fruition. That's when uh, God will settle accounts with you when you die. So as long as you're alive, you have a chance to be saved, and that's why we're having this conversation with you tonight. So then the final question, how can I get rid of my sin? How can I get rid of it? I don't want to deal with that. How do I fix the problem? In Acts chapter 2, Peter uh, stood up with the, uh, the other apostles, and he preached the first gospel sermon on this side of the cross. And in Acts chapter 2, that entire uh, uh, um, section, beginning at, at verse number uh, 15 and, and, and also 22, Peter preaches the gospel. When you look at verse number 22, he says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, and by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. He talks about the death of Christ. In verse number 31, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, that's the grave, neither his flesh did see corruption. So we have the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ preached. And then in verse number uh, 36, he describes the authority of Jesus. This same Jesus whom you crucified, God had made him both Lord and Christ. That's his authority. So then they believed that gospel in verse number 37. They were pricked in our hearts, and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter, repented, Peter responded, repent, turn away from your sin, and be baptized. Everything that I've shared with you tonight, Elisha and his, and his sepulcher, uh, the, the, the circumcision, 
and also the ordinance of the red heifer, all of that was related to the gospel and the baptism that we must uh, participate in. So the Bible says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You want to know how to get rid of your sins? You must hear it. Hear the gospel. You must believe it. You must repent of your sins. You must, be, you must confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you must be baptized, and then you'll be added to this body that we've been discussing in Acts 2.47. If anyone has any questions about what I've shared with you, please give me a call. My number is 281-827-1991. Again, my name is Joe Caesar from the O'Quinn Street Church of Christ in Lufkin, Texas. And my number is 281-827-1991. And I'll turn it over to Brother Flunder and Brother Brooks. Thank you.